I'd like to introduce our second speaker for tonight. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Mima Gear. Is it Gear or Gear? Gear. Dr. Mima Gear. She is CEO of Mimansa, an online health and wellness platform. Dr. Gear explores food as medicine and the aspects of diet that influence health and wellness through the gut microbiome. Understanding the influence of diet plays on your gut and how to address the gut-brain imbalances that, you're, that plague our modern world using ancient concepts that are reinventing themselves today. Dr. Gear is on the, fa the faculty at the Institute for Functional Medicine where she directs evidence development. She's a staff physician at the Deepak Chopra Center and holds a master's in nutrition from Columbia University and a medical degree from the University of Vermont. And let's see, and has residency and postdoctorate level training in laboratory medicine and clinical informatics from UCSF. Dr. Gear has held medical and product director roles in clinics, startups, and diagnostic labs. So please welcome Dr. Gear. Did I? Oh, good. It's on. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone, and thank you for staying. Um, I know it's a late night, so hopefully I'll keep you awake. <laughs> um, so today's talk is gonna definitely be a uh, continuation of what you've already learned, and maybe a little bit more superficial than the depth that you, uh, that you got from Alan, which was really wonderful. Um, we're gonna be focusing on, the, on personalized nutrition from the standpoint of the gut microbiome. I am a, a physician and trained in uh, go both conventional medicine, and like I mentioned, um, th that was mentioned uh, from UCSF, but then I actually made a big switch and went into functional medicine, uh, which I don't know if everybody's familiar with, but it's basically a holistic approach to medicine looking at the root cause of ailments. So in other words, it's not necessarily looking at what you need to cut off or what you need to treat in an urgent situation, but it's looking at chronic disease and how we can recalibrate the balance in your body to start to help your body heal naturally. Um, I then went on to train with Deepak Chopra to learn about Ayurvedic medicine in his framework called Perfect Health, where I now work in, and treat patients down in San Diego, and I also have a practice up in Marin. So if you're interested in working together, um, that is my uh, website, and the clinic's name is Mimansa Health. Okay, so let's start really big and ask the question, who are we? Okay, who are we? Spiritually. Spiritual beings, absolutely. Physical body, right? Most of us here are thinking about we, us, as the physical body, but we all know that we're so much more. And if this were a different topic, I would be getting into that. But we'll, we'll start today. We'll talk about the physical body. In Ayurveda, there's this term, and it's interesting. Alan also had an Ayurveda slide. There's this term called Anamaya Kosha, which is the physical body, the physical layer of your being. And that includes your cells, your DNA, and even potentially your microbiome. So we're going to get much more into that today. But our body consists of 37 trillion cells, right? And that those 37 trillion cells includes proteins and molecules and all the things we talked about earlier, how those things interact and everything else that that produces. You might also say, well, I'm more than my body. I'm, your, I'm my mind and I'm my brain, right? My brain controls my body. Does it really? Right? Your brain is 100 billion neurons. We're only using a fraction of that brain on a day-to-day -day basis. So what are we really, right? What are we really comprised of? And then we discovered our genes, right? And there were so many people that touted that our genes are who we are. And of course, your genes have predicted everything that is going to happen to you in your life and everything that happened to your parents and your grandparents. And therefore, your destiny is predetermined. But now we know that's not true. That's not all that we really are. If you look at our genes, we're 98% as similar to a chimp. Who feels like they're a chimp? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Um, but you know, we have consciousness, right? We have more than that. Um, so there, it, it's not just our genes. If you look at the history of evolution, and you also look at the evolution that happens in a, in a given body as 
you evolve, right, as you, as you go through from uh, a, a single cell into multiple cells into a human, they're so similar, right? We look almost the same as a bird, as a reptile, and as a fish. Just look at that similarity. And then how that then differentiates over time into the whole organize, organism that exists right now. So really, our genes are not us. Is it our genes and our environment that interact to make us who we are? Some people believe that's sufficient, that it really is our genes and then our environment, our epigenes, that interact, right? But now there's this concept that there's another layer. There's a layer of bacteria that essentially live in and on us in every aspect of our body and our being. And even when I trained in medical school, I did not learn about these bacteria. So this is a very recent finding that is new and many doctors are not yet aware of how to practice with this information. But it's not true that it doesn't exist because it does. So what we need to do is start to make correlations and start to understand how this new research applies in clinical practice. But the truth is we can't wait for 40 years before the clinical data comes out for us to start using it because the information is already available. We can do high throughput sequencing and measure large levels of DNA. And so we can measure these microbes and find out exactly what they're composed of. And then you can use systems biology and start to correlate how that actually affects our body. And then lastly, I want to add this layer, which is our toxins and hormones. It's not sufficient to just say we're our genes and our bacteria if we don't introduce this idea that there are foreign substances that are interacting with our genes and our bacteria. And it's really important, especially today, to address this in health. Because what we've accumulated over the fast, past 50 years has never been known to man. The chemicals that we are now exposed to in this lifespan has, have never existed before. So we do not yet know the effects these chemicals will have on our genes, on our microbiome, and on our children's genes and their microbiome. But we know that something might happen because the science is showing that that does happen, that does take place. So what is epigenetics? Is everybody familiar with the term epigenetics? Epigenetics is essentially the influence of the genes, or the changes that are caused by the genes in their expression. Not necessarily the actual genes, but how they, and whether or not they get expressed. We used to think that all genes, if they existed, got expressed, right? But now we know that there's a significant portion of genes that stay silent. We also know that, as Alan mentioned, there are genes that are actually influenced by your diet directly directly. So the food that you eat can go in and alter the expression of those genes and change how they get expressed. That's why it doesn't matter necessarily whether or not your parents had a certain ailment and it's showing up in your genes. It doesn't predict absolutely that you're going to get that ailment because you have the ability to affect this, the epigenetics. Okay. So really, we are these ecosystems. We are, we are living human ecosystem, living with bacteria every single day. Okay? Not only are we an individual ecosystem, but we are shared ecosystem. Sitting in this room, we're all sharing our microbiome. When we leave this room, we leave some of our microbiome behind. So this is all new. We didn't know this before. We're starting to realize the implications here. So there's this, this term that's now um, used quite often in science. It's called metagenomics. It's the study of the metagenome, which is a collective genome of microorganisms from an environmental sample. And that provides the uh, information on their diversity. So as you can see, when we first started looking at the human genome, things started to evolve quite a bit in the 90s, but now we're looking at the human microbiome. 
And that's what our main focus is in science, is, try, is in uh, genetic science particularly, is to try to figure out what influence this microbiome is playing on us and on our genetics. It really is in everything. So when you look at the human body and you were to measure samples in different parts of your body, you'll see that there's an entirely different spectrum based on where that sample is measured. So right now, we're only looking at stool samples for the gut microbiome. But in the future, you're going to start to see companies start to create tests that measure microbiome all over your body. And you'll also see doctors that are in each of these specialties start to talk about the specific microbial pattern of the eye, for example, or of the mouth, like we'll, you'll hear about hopefully in the holistic dentistry talk, because the microbiome of the mouth plays a really big role in your health. So the human microbiome we know is unique, okay? What does that mean? Do all humans have the same microbiome? No. Each of us has an independent, unique, individual microbiome. We also know that the microbiome is determined by the habitat that you lived in, okay? So your geographical location plays a big role in what you're going to look like in terms of the microbiome um, ecosystem that exists. And then we also know that this is not just necessarily a problem of a given area, it's actually worldwide. So you can start to map and create maps of microbial patterns throughout the world, globally. Not just in humans, but also in our soil, in our water, in our air. Right? So the ability to analyze and understand this is new, it's unique, and it's profound. It's changing the way we're doing everything. Our microbiome specifically, as we know, is affecting our health. And so it's a particularly important subject for this group to understand. It affects your mood, right? So this is where most of the research is right now with gut-brain, is to understand how the bacteria in our gut are influencing our mind and our mood. And all of these different mental health conditions that we used to think were related to, potentially not necessarily related to any biology, we're actually mapping back to changes in the microbi microbial environment. We also know that the gut microbiome affects immunity. Right? So a majority of immune cells are trained within the actual GALT, which is the gastrointestinal uh, lymphatic tissue that exists. That's when you first get exposed to a foreign substance, and that's when your body starts to learn how to react to it. Is this a friend or is this an enemy? Is this something I'm going to attack or I'm going to, is this something I'm going to allow in? Right? So the, all of that training happens in the gut. And so the gut plays a really big role there, and now we're understanding it's actually not just the, the, the tissue there, but it's also the microbiome. There's this concept of the gut-brain axis that Alan also talked about, which is looking at the influence not just of the brain to the gut, which we used to know existed, which was uh, directly related where you can influence the gut, but now we're realizing that the gut can by itself produce factors that influence the brain. That's really new, right? That the gut by itself can produce things that can influence the brain. And what else is new is that it's not just your own cells in the gut, it's these microorganisms that independently are producing metabolites, hormones, serotonin, et cetera, that can go back and feed back the rest of your body. So it's really a time when we need to start looking at this ecosystem and examine, does my, health, does my bacteria look healthy? Or are there things in here that could be causing them to go on the more unhealthy side? So most of the research right now is trying to make that correlation. Disease, clinical symptoms, bacteria, how are they related? And the jury's out on exactly what that is. But we're making a lot of progress on how they're related. What we're realizing now, which I think is really amazing because we didn't give it enough um, emphasis, is the importance of diet. Okay? I think many of us who are here intuitively know that diet matters, but we didn't realize how much it influences the microbiome. Studies are showing that if you change your diet, you can then start to see changes in the microbiome within a week. A week. 
<laughs> right? How long does it take before a drug starts to show an effect like that? Yeah, several months sometimes before you start to see significant changes. So within one week of eating well, you can start to see changes in these amazing organisms that are influencing everything in your body. Diet can also alter our gene expression. This is a pretty famous study where they looked at these mice that have this specific gene defect that caused it to be the one on the left, which is the plump, obese, yellow-colored mouse. But then when you fed those mice vitamin B12, folic acid, choline, and betaine, during the pregnancy, the animals gave birth to these brown pups. So this is an example showing us that nutrigenomics like Alan mentioned, is a real concept that there are genes that can directly be influenced by diet. But, you know, us humans have so many options. We've got so many different foods to eat and so many different places to buy it. The question becomes, what is the best diet for me? So you've probably all heard about all these different diets, omnivore, DASH diet, paleo, low, low GI stands for glycemic index, gluten-free, Weight Watchers. Who's tried at least one of these? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's tried all of them? <laughs> Great. Thanks for confessing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very confusing. And all you end up being able to do is experiment. Try one, see if it works. Try another, see if it works. But what we're now realizing is that we can start to measure differences and that we all have unique metabolism. So this is an example of some research that came out of um, a group in Israel where they started to identify that uh, when you gave two different individuals the same amount of carbohydrates, they actually had a different metabolism, a different way of metabolizing those carbohydrates, and therefore burn through those carbs completely differently. Who's surprised by that? No one, right? You intuitively know that. Yet, we have been prescribing people the exact same diet and expecting them all to lose weight the same way. We've been saying you need to eat X amount of calories, this many grams of carbs, fat, and protein in order to be healthy. Our formulas are all singular. They're not looking at this variability, right? So this is a new concept that hasn't yet been brought into practice, but is there in the science. Here's the case. So a patient came in to me, she was a 31-year-old female, avid athlete. She used to cycle two to three hours a day, okay? Long distance races. One of her favorite things to do was to go from San Francisco to LA and back. <laughs> she was 230 pounds when I met her, and since her 20s, she had been that weight. She was unable to lose weight at all, and she had a history of anorexia and bulimia, so she actually had an eating disorder and still held on to this weight. So as a functional medicine doctor, I took a look at her labs, and uh, this is what they looked like. Total cholesterol was normal, HDL was actually in a high range, so it's a good, good number, and the rest of the measurements that you have here are related to her lipids. They all kind of look like they're sort of in the better range, even her triglycerides were low. Her CRP, if you look over there, at 4.9 was a little bit high, which is an inflammatory marker. Her insulin was right in the middle, glucose 82. Now, when I started to measure her thyroid, that's when I noticed a few things, right? Her um, thyroid showed two antibodies that were elevated, uh, TPO and um, thyroglobulin, both highly elevated in this young lady in her 30s. And then I looked at her gut, and here's what I found. Low beneficial bacteria. So we talked about good and bad bacteria. Her good bacteria were extremely depleted. She had poor digestion, and everything she was eating was not actually being metabolized. It was coming out in her stool. So this athlete who was stuck at this really high weight, pushing every single day to try to lose weight, two to three hours, was not budging, extremely labile emotionally, depressed, because of what's happening in her thyroid and her gut, okay? And most doctors would miss that and did not even look there because there are clinical protocols currently don't include looking at the thyroid antibodies as part of general medical practice. And they do not include looking at the gut microbiome as part of general medical practice. 
So what did we do? I carefully monitored her food diary and noticed that she had uh, certain foods in there that still needed some tweaking. So although she was very conscious about how she was eating, she wasn't eating in a way that was optimal for her condition, that was not going to be optimizing her gut health. We eliminated gluten, dairy, eggs, nightshades in her case, as well as removed all toxins from her environment and from her food. We started to uh, monitor her. We decreased her stress. She started to meditate. She started to do grat grat gratitude practices. Right? She was extremely labile when she first met me. But after having practiced all this on her own, with a lot of her own initiative, she made some great progress. She started to sleep better. She actually decreased her exercise intensity. I want to emphasize that point because it was asked earlier about exercise. I think exercise has a lot of benefits, but what I see is people over-exercising and trying to push their body into a state when they're already in a chronic inflammatory state. And I want to caution you on doing that because it's not going to necessarily give you the results that you want. It often leads to more inflammation and worse health. Okay? So we started her on a gut protocol, which included L-glutamine, curcumin, ginger, and fiber. We used a very high dose vitamin D. We also put her on some methylation precursors. She did have a methylation gene defect, high dose pro probiotics, and, pre and probiotic foods. In six months, her weight dropped from 220 to 177 pounds, which I actually think is a good steady weight loss. What you don't want to do is drop somebody's weight in one or two months. Um, her blood pressure dropped from 138 over 80, being a 30-something-year-old female. She should never have had high blood pressure like that to a much more healthy, normal, even below healthy, normal level of 98 over 57. We were pushing hydration on her as well. And her thyroid antibodies actually normalized. So that was one of the best things, was when she came in to the end in her last visit with me, she was calm, happy, smiling, and said she felt normal. And that was all related to her thyroid. So this really illustrates the point that it's not just one thing, that it's a combination of your epigenetics, your environment, as well as your micro microbiome, and that's what determines who we are in terms of your physical body. So let's talk a little bit more about the microbiome itself. Now there are some studies that are looking at this new concept that's called chronobiology. Have you heard of this term, chronobiology? So it's this idea that these little microbes actually have clocks. They have their own circadian rhythm. So these bacteria that are living on and with us are following a clock. They wake up in the morning, they go to bed at night, just like we do. Right? And so if you're feeling sleepy right now, you should be sleepy. <laughs> this is the right time. So for these bacteria, they are synchronizing with what's happening in nature. Right? So how, how many people go out into nature and all of a sudden feel incredibly better, like almost instantaneously? What is that? Is it the fresh air? Is it something in, in the environment that's, that's you know, resonating with you better? Or is it our microbiome that's synchronizing with the microbiome in nature? Now, we don't really know the answer to that. But what we do know is that they've done studies and looked at people who travel, whether it's jet lag from travel or if it's overnight workers who are actually working through the night not sleeping according to daily rhythms. And they found that their circadian rhythm actually gets imbalanced. The microbiome themselves start to have difficulty synchronizing to the new clock and stay connected to the old clock that they were on. Okay, so when you travel, say you go across the country, the microbiome are still stuck with your old time. And what they're also finding is that this disruption actually results in insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, and obesity. Yes. <laughs> so that the root cause could possibly be these microbiome changes before any of the biomarker changes come up. Yes. It also affects shift workers as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the question was, does it also affect shift workers as well? And yes, the studies have shown that case in uh, shift workers. Yes. So the effects of jet lag are essentially the creation of this um, environment where you have uh, cell growth and DNA, DNA repair being affected. And you have the ability to potentially become glucose intolerant. 
So it's important to remember that we do not live in isolation from our environment. And as much as we start to remove ourselves, we're still eating food that came from the environment to some degree, that came from the soil. And so our soil microbiome plays a critical role in the health of our gut microbiome, right? So that piece is often ignored in medicine. We wanna really pay attention to what is the quality of our air, our water, and our soil. Not just because we're conscious beings and we care about other beings, but also because we care about ourselves and these things are directly affecting our health. And in our ecosystem within our body, just like in any other ecosystem, health equals diversity. So there's no one organism that you want to optimize. There's no one organism that's gonna be the miracle bacteria that's gonna have us live and, and you know, get to Mars. There's actually a whole slew of, of bacteria and viruses and fungi that need to work together in harmony in order to create health. We can actually look at our soil microbiome and look at the diversity of our so soil microbiome itself. And as you know, monocultures, certain soil practices, the types of fertilizer we use, the chemicals that we use, all of that plays a role in the diversity of that soil microbiome. This is why you see so much of a push towards organic foods and even towards potentially biodynamic farming, which is one of the best ways to preserve nutrients within the soil. And that, in effect, will impact our gut microbiome. So this figure shows you that the gut microbiome actually changes over time. So you have a core microbiome, let's say a woman who is pregnant, that might have a, a, a certain picture that looks like this where she has facultative anaerobes as well as proteobacteria present. And then once the baby's born, the baby actually has a totally different composition that they often get influenced by mom, but have to have their own development that happens there as well. So the infant often has bacteroidetes and bifidobacteria present. And then as they grow and go through life, that composition changes as well. Environmental <coughs> pollutants. So as we increase the amount of chemicals that are being produced and delivered throughout the world, we are also having an effect with each of those chemicals on our microbiome. And those effects are not positive. The effects are disruption of the human microbiome. So what is in your food supply is critical, right? Because that's gonna go and interact directly with your gut. These are the types of heavy metals that I often see showing up in patients when they come to see me. And they're often surprised. They'll come in with symptoms like, I'm feeling really anxious and I don't really know what's going on, or more likely, I'm feeling really lethargic and my energy is crashing and I don't know why. And then we'll do a, a deep dive into what are the toxins potentially in your environment, what does your diet look like, potentially do a heavy metal analysis, and lo and behold, there's usually something that's higher than it should be. How do those environmental toxins actually work? They could either be directly metabolized by the microbes, they could be metabolized and then taken up and conjugated by the liver and that's where they cause the damage. They can induce dysbiosis where they intercalate and actually affect the bacteria directly or they can actually go in and interfere with the enzymes. Okay, those are the mechanisms that are currently being looked at. We also know that stress affects our gut microbiome. There's this balance where we have the good bacteria and we have bad bacteria. And when you take stress and add that to the picture, you get this imbalance where the bad bacteria tend to take over and they cause more disease. So that's how the stress starts to influence things. So what do we do about all this? Okay, It seems like a problem that might not be something we could solve, but yet I just told you that in one week of changing your diet, you can affect your microbiome. So I think this is one of the best places to start when it comes to health, is to start by looking at your own microbiome and start to see what you can do to eat a more healthful diet that will support your microbiome. So the first thing you wanna do is remove all processed food, 
okay? Because those processed foods are what we're talking about. They are these pollutants that are coming in and intercalating and affecting these bacteria in a way that you don't want. So going back to the cleanest food source possible, that's the first step. The next is introducing foods that are actually going to be supportive of the growth and development of these actual bacteria. So probiotic foods, we all know what those are, right? Yogurt, kefir, uh, having things like horseradish, pickles, all of these things are going to increase fermentation and increase the amount of bacteria that are present in your body. But who has not heard about this term prebiotic? Prebiotic? Oh, good. You've all heard about it. So most people that I, when I, when I talk about this, don't, are not that familiar with the idea of a prebiotic. A prebiotic is basically, if you think about it, indigestible fiber that forms the support system for the bacteria to glow, grow and flourish. So if you don't have good prebiotics present and you're taking all this great bacteria, you're not necessarily supporting the continual growth and, um, and uh, development of bacteria that are going to stay in the gut. And it's important to remember that even though we might have general recommendations that each of us is in fact unique. Can you go back yes. to the one more? So name those prebiotics. Yes, so we've got yogurt, pickles. So those, those are the oh, I'm sorry, prebiotics. Onions. onions, these are dandelion greens. And um, sunchokes. Sunchokes. Sunchokes, yeah. Sunchokes, jicama, rutabaga. There's all these vegetables that are complex fibers that we probably ate at some point. Maybe your grandmother made them. Um, and they've been sort of removed out of our diet. Now, sometimes I'll ask people what vegetables they're eating. They're like carrots and peas. You know, this is the, this is the true state of our country. So really diversifying the plant base of your diet is how you're going to get support for these microbiota. So again, it's important to remember that we are unique and also it depends on where you live. There's no one diet that's gonna be perfect for every one of us because you have to take into account geography as well. You also need to map patterns over lifetime. It's not enough to do a single analysis of the microbiome and say, this is what my diet is gonna be for the rest of my life because I just told you that what you eat will affect um, well, your, your microbiome and within a week. So you need to continuously make changes, try to keep those changes steady for a period of time and remeasure and see how that's actually affected you. And then there's this concept of fecal transplants. So this is a study where they took um, a, a specimen from an obese twin and put it into a recipient mice and actually induced fat, induced adiposity within this mice just by taking a fecal sample and transplanting a fecal sample into another organism. So you'll see more and more about this coming out as we learn how to study this in a safe manner and start to address different disease conditions with uh, that kind of method. So overall, our diet really does need to be unique. If you look at these two individuals, you might automatically think the one on the left is healthy. But that's not true because oftentimes the one on the left has anxiety, has insomnia, depression. And the one on the right could be perfectly healthy. Her body just isn't losing as much weight because she's not eating the right foods to help her lose weight. So it's important to, to note that there's, there, these prescriptions that you get where everything is the same for you is likely not to be true. For example, not all carbs are bad for us. So here's a study that looked at carbohydrates and fiber and resistant starch and showed that fiber and resistant starch were both necessary to positively affect all these different bacteria and increase the amount that were present. Same with fat. So this is a study that looked at high fat, low fat, high saturated fat, high unsaturated fat. And you'll see that um, the high saturated fat had an elevation of bacteroidetes and also this uh, fecalobacterium at the end, which aren't necessarily always positive. And then at the bottom, you have high unsaturated fat that actually increased this last category, acromantiae, which they're finding to be associated with weight loss. So even though you have a high amount of fat, it's increasing this bacteria that's associated with um, losing weight. Yes? So when you're saying high saturated, 
You're saying high saturated fat has a negative impact. Is that the same fat that ketogenic diets are recommending? In this particular um, study, high saturated fats increase certain bacteria that tend to be associated with certain disease conditions. I'm not making any claims beyond that. Um, ketogenic diets are not necessarily all saturated fat. And a good modified ketogenic diet will look at monounsaturated fats as a priority and will include avocados, olive oil, nuts, and seeds as the majority of where you're getting your fat rather than bacon and uh, you know, um, highly marbleized meats, right? So quality of your food is very important and we can't forget that. Go ahead. And coconut oil, plant-based coconut, plant-based fats. There, jury's out in coconut oil. Um, most of us in functional medicine are still strong believers of its health benefits. Um, but you know, as you see, there's a lot of pushback on, on coconut oil. So we'll see how all that falls. And then this is another controversial one. What about meat? So plant protein increase bifidobacterium lactobacillus, whereas animal protein increases the other ones here, bacteroidetes, um, as well as ruminococcus, which are also shown to increase these things called TMAO, which are inflammatory markers that then potentially could result in cardiovascular disease and IBD, okay? Whereas the plant proteins um, actually increase short-chain fatty acids, which are beneficial to your body, and increase your gut barrier, Okay, so decrease the ability of foreign substance to getting into your gut and increase Treg cells, which are immune cells in your gut. So positive benefits from the plant protein. Yes? When they did that study, did they use grass-fed, grass-finished beef? No. Or just normal beef? Normal, so. <laughs> yes, and that's a great point. I mean, this is not saying that animal protein should be removed from your diet. I think that it's, it's important to recognize that not everyone does well on a plant-based diet and that many of us need to still get our uh, nutrients um, because they're more readily and easily absorbed from animals. Uh, but, um, but even with that, there are quite a few health benefits to a plant-based diet beyond that because the polyphenols and all these other things that you're getting. And so why does that matter? Well, who's heard of leaky gut? Yeah, so leaky gut is well known now. Technically, the term should be intestinal permeability. Leaky gut's not a medical term. Um, but basically, it's this concept of having bloating, gas, cramps, food sensitivities, joint pains, rashes, and potentially even autoimmunity, okay? Not all of them, but any one of them could show up as a, as a symptom. So how does that work? Well. It, in leaky gut, basically the idea is that our gut cells are no longer tightly connected because of certain disruptions, that whether it came in from environmental toxins, et cetera, stress, our cells start to separate. And the proteins that normally join them in our gut start to loosen up and create holes. And foods that normally wouldn't get into your bloodstream now start getting in and are being exposed to your immune system. Your immune system might recognize them as foreign and start to cause inflammation and different reactions. And all of a sudden you have food sensitivities that you never had before, okay? But when you look at a food sensitivity test on a patient with intestinal permeability, it's positive all the way through, almost like you know, 30%, 40, 50% of the different uh, antigens are showing up as positive. That's a sign that it's not specific, right? It's, it's too broad to be any specific antigen that's causing the problem. And that's when we map back to intestinal permeability. This is where the science is today, that the food antigens are actually getting through and causing these inflammatory reactions. And there are tests available that will be able to um, look at your, the, those antigens to see whether or not you're reacting to them. There are also certain foods that enhance certain bacteria. So I've listed them here. And uh, you're welcome to take a photo, and we'll provide the slides after. But basically, these are optimal foods to help increase some of those um, uh, resistant starches that we were talking about that these bacteria need in order to grow optimally. 
So I'm sure many of you are getting a lot of these foods in your diet, but it's a question of how much are you getting, how often you're eating it, and is it a regular part of your diet? So make sure that you're including a good amount of prebiotic foods to feed your gut flora. So this could include things like chickpeas, asparagus, um, you know, different things like garlic, and then probiotic foods. These are kimchi, um, yogurt, you know, just making sure that you're incorporating this into your meals every single day. And then just a reminder that as we move into more technology, more development, more industry, that we can't forget that we're still these humans living with these microbial ecosystems that need to interact and that we can't eliminate nature and, and natural things like plants and grass and trees from our basic human needs because we do have this resonance that exists in our body. We can see this resonance and how the microbials, uh, the, these, these bacteria interact with us. We can also see this resonance in how they interact with others. And so as we leave this world, I want you to ask yourself, what are you really leaving behind? Thank you. Any more questions? Recently, we had uh, physicals, uh, yearly physicals, and um, I, had, I had gone to an integrated doc, and he, he did about 100 different blood tests, and I had those sent to my, my regular doc. And so during the, during the physical, she kept referring to the integrated doc as our funky doc. <laughs> And I'm just wondering, why aren't all docs integrated? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a great question. I asked the same question. <laughs> um, I would love to believe that we can create a world where both can exist in harmony. Because right now, the opposition is not doing anybody any service. You know, having a situation where you have to pick as a patient, do I listen to this one person who's calling the other one a quack, or do I listen to this other one who's making a lot of sense and I like what they're saying, but it's costing me so much money and they've ordered so many tests, I don't know what to do with them. And the two cannot communicate, right? So it's not a system we really want to have perpetuate, yet that's the direction things are going. It's very divided. What we need more is people that are going to come in that are willing to work together, that are willing to try to solve this problem for the patient who's really the one that matters and not necessarily for the system and trying to protect their territory. Or their ego. Or their ego. I want to know your perspective around uh, functional medicine and the cure it can have for MS. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, with uh, many of these chronic diseases, you'll find as you start to read the literature, it's mapping back to very similar things like I've talked about. Environmental toxins, uh, immunity, the immune response, your body's ability to stave off disease, right? How can you, through diet, nutrition, and supplements, micronutrients, build an environment of higher resilience? so that when a virus comes in or when something comes in, that you're able to fight it off. With chronic disease, like I said, there are all these new substances that we did not, we don't know how to defend ourselves against. So we don't yet know whether or not it's a certain single virus like EBV. You know, you hear about the, the single EBV folks or the CMV folks that say it's just this one thing. And then there are others that say, well, it can't just be that it was one thing. It's got to be much more. It's got to be a combination of things. I'm in the camp of it's a combination of things. Um, and the same with MS. You know, it really is a systems approach in functional medicine, starting with the gut, looking at what all, all the toxins are and the environmental factors, and then starting to slowly clean them out one at a time. Is there potentially a fungus or something else that... Uh, that could be causing an imbalance, fungal or viral. Sometimes some doctors might treat that. Others will choose to treat it with herbs. 
So it's a bit of a balancing act in how it's done, but the approach is very much whole systems. What's the best way to detox heavy metal? That's a great question. Um, I personally really like natural detox, okay? Natural detox includes diet. So, um, you know, foods like I mentioned here, dandelion greens, parsley, celery, these are highly potent foods that if you start to juice or eat them regularly, you're using that to help cleanse, okay? even heavy metals. Okay, we've lived around toxins for many years, but it's not until you get older or there's some other immune compromise that things start to cause problems. So if we can help our body rebalance with food or with, with exercise, uh, include yoga, meditation, and breath work in that exercise, when you start to do these practices and you change your diet, you can often bring your balance back. Now, there are other approaches using certain supplements that also help detox, different herbs that help detox. So there's all different approaches. And you bring up this topic of detoxification that isn't actually really recognized in Western medicine, but is very much recognized in Eastern medicine. So looking into different practices like Chinese medicine or Ayurveda, those are other approaches to help detox. What is the difference between a functional and an integrative medicine? Yeah. Um, integrative medicine or integrative health is looking at multiple modalities, okay? So it's often like, you know, it's, it's also in the category of comp complementary medicine because it'll include acupuncture. It includes all these different services, different types of therapy. Functional medicine is kind of like a singular approach and saying um, this is how we approach medical diagnostic um, workup. Okay, this is how we approach a disease. So if you come into a functional doctor with diabetes, they'll be looking at it very differently than if you go to a primary care doctor. It's not that they ignore the primary care approach. They still will look at the lab values. They'll still address those issues, but they're not going to be managing your medicines as much. They're going to be trying to get you potentially to increase your health so that you hopefully at some point can adjust your meds. So if you don't think this is too off topic, I'm just curious, when you had your training at the Chopra Center, did you have any interaction with Deepak Chopra himself? And I'm just wondering what that experience was like. If oh, you yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's wonderful. Um, Dr. Chopra has done so much great work, and I did um, have a chance to interact with him a few times. And as you all know, one of his big uh, missions right now is to raise consciousness throughout the world. So. If any of you are not meditating, I should have put this as my first slide. Um, you know, when it comes to DNA damage and your body's ability to repair and also to calm your mind and to, to connect, um, meditation is one of the most effective things. So I would say that was one of the most profound things he brings is the um, free teaching that he offers with Oprah on their 21-day meditation that anyone can go and Google 21-day meditation Deepak and get access to this 21-day meditation. They change it all the time, and it gives you a chance to do a 20-minute meditation every single day. And like Alan, I believe that daily practice is how we're gonna to start to make change. It's not what you do once a week. It's what you do every single day that's gonna affect your health. Yeah. Um, yes, you were talking about how stress affects the gut biome and can kind of tip the scales towards unhealthy things there. Um, I think we have, you know, maybe sort of a epidemic of post-traumatic stress going on and anxiety. And dealing with that from the functional medicine model, but then working with mental and emo emotional health professionals, um, how do you see how those work together? Yeah, thank you. I think that's a critical piece, um, and this has more to do also with our emotional body, you know. Um, so far, all I've talked about is our physical body. We haven't really gotten into how the physical body interacts with your emotions and how those interactions affect health and disease. So in Ayurveda, there's this, uh, this concept of diagnosis before diagnosis, and, and this, this concept of doshas. You've heard of vata, pitta, and kapha, these three doshas. So these are all based on elements, that we have different constitutions based on our elements and when we're born. 
Now, no, not only does that influence your physical body, but those elements also influence your emotional body, your emotional states, right? So uh, we start to detect energetic changes earlier using Ayurveda than what we do in Western medicine. In Western medicine, we don't diagnose something until it shows up in a, in a, in a cellular change or tissue level change or, or something you can measure in your blood. In Eastern medicine, they're looking at energy, the strange concept of energy, right? How does energy affect your physical body? Well, of course it does, because we see all these organisms that are vibrating around us all the time. And we know that we're influenced at some level by electromagnetic um, frequencies and things like that. We're seeing the data. So energy does affect us. We're just starting to figure out how we're going to measure it. And so this is where I think the emotional layer comes in, because if we can show that energy is affecting us to the level where it pre predisposes you to disease, then you can also show that emotional you know, uh, health can protect you from disease. And that's where I think the mental uh, health is so critical. Not only that, but also from the recovery side. You know, we, we don't take uh, enough, we don't give enough credit to what it means to feel cared for. We were talking earlier about the placebo effect and how knowing that somebody is caring for you or loves you or is praying for you and how much of a difference that makes in someone's recovery or health. Well, also being able to process what's happening to you when you have a disease, to be able to talk to somebody about it, for them to work through it with you can significantly affect your recovery. Okay, so I actually think mental health needs to come not only into all of our health care, but definitely plays a role in functional medicine and should be a core part of every functional medicine team. Can you give us your contact information again? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so it's a request for contact information. Let's take two, two more questions here and here, and then we'll go. Uh, okay. Um, in terms of functional medicine, um, you didn't address, um, w was brought, intermittent fasting was brought up earlier. Yes. And I'm wondering what, um, what you would say to that, and especially in relation to um, type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. because I was told that I really need to eat three meals a day, mm -hmm. but if you do the intermittent fasting and you try to but I was told you need to have five to six hours between each meal. You really can't eat three meals a day doing intermittent fasting. Right. So what would you uh, recommend around that? Yeah, um, thank you. Well, there's, there's different types of intermittent fasts, right? So there are different numbers of hours that you spend fasting. So you could potentially do a 12-hour fast and uh, do three meals a day. But with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, it really depends on what's happening with your blood glucose levels. If your blood glucose is plummeting, um, you know, if it's going really high and plummeting, then you might be a little bit more labile. So when you fast, it's going to be much more challenging. Okay? If you can get your blood, pressure, or blood sugar to a point where it's relatively steady and is okay when you feel okay when it's low, then you might be ready to intermittent fast. So it depends on the individual on how well their body can deal with fasting. Another group that I found has trouble with fasting is women that are going through hormonal issues. Even though fasting can support the, um, the hormones in the sense that it gives you a chance to clear it and all this stuff, initially it can be quite challenging uh, symptomatically to fast. And then um, uh, there was another group that I was going to bring up. but I, oh, According to Ayurveda, um, there are these three different doshas. The vata dosha, which is the air quality, um, tends to not do so well on fasting because they naturally skip meals. So the antidote to that is to get them to eat more regularly, whereas the other two doshas do perfectly well with fasting. So you know, it's just interesting when you lo look at the different frameworks, what you're noticing is it, it, the answer is it depends, and that's why we're here talking about personalized nutrition and personalized medicine because we have to look at each person individually. Great. Okay, last question. So how does one get access to the slides? And then my second question is, um, how do you treat yeast, like as in systemic yeast, um, yeah. infestation, all kinds of different yeast? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so there'll be, there'll be people out there that still argue that yeast doesn't cause a problem. 
<laughs> but, um, but you know, there are juries out in terms of whether or not what we're measuring is truly there. So for example, if you got a stool analysis and it showed yeast growth, is that really a valid test, right? So the jury's out on that. But there are people practicing on it based on that. So if you get a positive result, they'll treat you. And they might treat you with a very strong antifungal, which, as I mentioned earlier, your, bacteria, your microbiome includes viruses, bacteria, and fungi. So we don't know what the effect will be of having a very strong reaction to remove all the yeast on what are the protective effects that those yeasts might have had in your body. But on the flip side, many conditions actually start to resolve as you address the yeast. So from an anecdotal standpoint, we see patients getting better when the yeast get addressed or treated. So I personally like to start with a dietary approach, low sugar to no sugar. Okay, so very low carb, low to no sugar, uh, what they call currently the anti-candida diet, um, is a good way to start, where you're first removing all the things that are going to cause the perpetuation of those yeast. And then if you need, you know, seek treatment. So there are obviously pharmaceutical antifungals that you could seek, and then there is natural antifungals and different herbs that you can take that are um, available. Uh, oregano oil is one example of a natural way to affect uh, bacteria and yeast that might be growing out of proportion. Um, neem is another way to affect different, um, which is more on the Ayurvedic side. So uh, there are herbal and natural ways to start to approach the yeast. Did I get the whole question? Yeah. Yeah, so those are the things I tend to use. What herb? Neem. Okay. Uh, oregano oil, or I'll go to um, use uh, antifungal if needed. Nice statin, those kinds of things. Okay. Thank you yeah. very much for coming. <laughs>